This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Bagley. A new world record for archery is destined to be set again in Kentucky at the NASP National Tournament in May. But something even more exciting is the introduction of a new element, the NASP IBO 3D Challenge. We go inside outdoors to learn more about this additional style of archery that builds on what already thousands of student archers have down pat. Tournament organizers join us next on Kentucky Afield Radio. For Mother's Day, how many moms would like to go fishing? Mm. Well, how about this? Genuine family time with real conversations. Perfect. That's more like it. You know, that's what happens when you fish. You catch up on life. Kentucky Fish and Wildlife says learn more about lakes near your family. Stocked and ready to hook memories at fw.ky.gov. I don't know what you mean by skipper. Skipper? Skipper. 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 Hey, skipper. What? Don't skip the life jackets. Life jackets. You're right. Thanks for the reminder. Water officers everywhere remind you, your life jackets got your back. And the backing of everyone that wants you to come home alive. So, skipper, don't skip the life jackets. A public service message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Ask any kid you see about what they like in school, and chances are you will hear archery pop up with regularity. And it's not just schools in rural Kentucky. This is everywhere, nationwide. What was pretty much just found once upon a time as an activity in summer camp is now commonplace in a kid's life. It gives them personal involvement at school and discipline, teamwork, focus, better grades, better attendance, and self-confidence through the roof. And it is thanks to NASP, the National Archery in the Schools program. The National Championship for NASP is coming up May 8th and 9th in Louisville. 10,000 kids plus. And this year there is something new, the 3D Challenge. And on the show is Roy Grimes, president of NASP. Also Brian Markham, he's the president of the International Bow Hunting Organization, the IBO. Gents, welcome to the show. And Brian, tell me more about your group. Well, the IBO was founded in 1984. Our primary mission is to promote, encourage, and foster the sport of bow hunting. A 3D target is a target that looks like an animal. Correct. Yes. Back uh, when the IBO was formed, there were many small archery organizations, or I should say local archery clubs, and none of them were organized or unified into a national level of competition. The IBO was able to organize a national level schedule for shoots, and we were the first to do that in what we call 3D archery. Uh, If you remember back in the old days, I guess, we used to laminate cardboard together and put photos of animals on there for a 2D archery experience once 3D animals came out. We used to drive, you know, halfway across the country to shoot the first 3D animals. We realized that this was a great opportunity to bring these competitors together, to unify them in a common cause, and that's to promote the sport of bow hunting through the 3D competition. Roy, let me ask you, give me the minute message on NASP. Well, National Archery in the Schools program started in 2002. Our mission was to do two things, to improve performance of students in school and to increase participation in the shooting sports. And you've done that and then some. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people have pulled together to, to make all of that happen. We're talking to Roy Grimes today and Brian Markham of the IBO because you two have joined forces for something that students who shoot NASP Come the national tournament for the year 2014, they're going to they're gonna see something new there. And if I've got this written down right, the NASP IBO 3D Challenge. Did I say it right? Yeah, that's what we call it, right, Brian? Correct, yes. Now, that's going to be debuted at this year's national tournament in Louisville. 
Right. We'll have, uh, of the 10,800 students that we expect to participate in the Bullseye Tournament, we'll have, the, that's the standard NASP tournament. That, by the way, will break our own Guinness record again. About 4,600 of those students will have an opportunity to register ahead of time for the 3D tournament that the IBO and NASP are putting on. And so this is going to be sort of a, I'll call it a sub-tournament of the tournament. It's not the concentric rings that we're used to seeing on a paper target. These are what Brian was saying a moment ago. They look like real animals. Right. As a matter of fact, the animals are they are very specific. They'll be Each range will have five targets. One of the targets will be a sheep, a deer, a pronghorn antelope, a bear, and a wild turkey. So that is the 3D challenge. Understand that term 3D, three-dimensional. So it looks like the real thing. You're not shooting at a piece of paper with a picture or drawing on it. Now, they're still inanimate objects, pieces of foam that happen to be shaped to look like North American wildlife species. What kind of impact, Brian, do you think this is going to have? Well, we're hoping that it translates into more kids out in the field. Um, Every time that we've put 3D animals in front of kids, they just absolutely love it. And uh, we're hoping to see more interest at the local club level and also the national level. We hope to duplicate this archery event at our national championship shoots and our world championship. Of course, we ultimately hope that this translates into more kids afield. And that is one of our primary goals as the organization, is to pass on our bow hunting heritage. And what a great way to do that, you know, to introduce these kids to 3D archery. And Charlie, if I may, sure. looking at surveys of NAS students over the past more than a decade, we know two things from them, that 56% of those NAS students said that they'd like to know more about bow hunting, and 61% in a survey just done last summer said they'd like to shoot 3D. So we are addressing desires of the NAF students that have already joined us. That's what I was going to ask. What gap is this filling? Could you take a fourth grader and you take a senior in high school, they're doing the exact same sport when you stand there at a 10 or 15 meter target line and shoot at a bullseye. A person asked me the other day, there needs to be something more to challenge them along the way. Do you see that maybe this is doing that or will do that, this IBO 3D challenge? I see two ways that that's going to happen. First of all, the kids that come to the national tournament won't be just shooting for 56 minutes and then being done, especially if you come from Oregon or Arizona and you've come all the way and you shoot the bullseye tournament and now you've been there for two days. If they've registered for 3D, they'll have another opportunity to compete, to shoot another 30 arrows for an hour. So there'll be more archery shooting for each of these kids that register for both of the events. And certainly we've, we've learned, again, from the survey last year of national tournament, students, a a large survey was done, and the longer they've been in the program, the more they want to do some additional archery activities. So this will address that, that the bullseye for some of the kids gets a little bit uh, mundane after a while. Now, they like doing it, and they love the competition, but there are other archery games for them to play. Other archery Uh, games. You're wanting to say something, Brian. Go ahead. Yeah, and I, I might like to add a little bit to that. Um, you know, we're we're actually introducing a new element or a new discipline to these kids and, and the fact that they have to judge the distance. You know, we know the targets are going to be set between 10 and 15 meters, but they still have to compensate for that little bit of distance change. Those targets aren't marked like the targets that they've been shooting at the NAS nationals they will have to compensate for that extra distance and that goes along with the pure definition of 3d archery and that's three-dimensional targets at an unknown distance and it just creates a skill that they aren't normally accustomed to you're right that does add like you were asking about charlie an additional challenge i just watched us test this event uh, a while back at the national wild turkey federation's convention with some nashville area students and it was pretty interesting to watch them go from the 15 meter sheep to a 10 meter turkey and then in between targets that they didn't quite know how far they were sometimes that first arrow would miss a little bit until they got a new aiming point down So we have a shooting range that's going to have five targets, Mm -hmm. and the first target will be 10 meters away. The last target will be 15 meters away. Targets two, three, and four, you don't really know. It's somewhere between 10 and 15. That's right. And you don't get a practice 
shot at each target, do you? You only get one practice end of six arrows, and that's at the target that you happen to be in front of. So if your coach assigns you to start on the turkey or the bear or the antelope, that's the only practice you'll get. That's just to warm up your shooting muscles. But then after that, as you move to the other targets, there'll be no practice, just scoring arrows. There are some very strong similarities between the bullseye shooting and the 3D shooting for the NAS students, and that's been very important to us as we develop this so that it's not a completely foreign experience to them. The all-new 3D Archery Challenge is the topic, and it is sure to be a hit with kids. Introduced this year at the NASP National Championship. It's in Louisville in May. Brian Markham, who heads IBO, and Roy Grimes, president of NASP, are my guests. We'll be back with more on Kentucky Field Radio. We are back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and I can't wait to see the look on students' faces this year at the NAS National Tournament. And something adding to the excitement this year is an event that everyone's talking about, the NASP IBO 3D Challenge. Kind of a tournament within the tournament of lifelike three-dimensional targets. A joint effort between NASP and the International Bow Hunting Organization, IBO. President Grimes, let's talk about scoring. How do you score? How do you know who wins? The tin ring is exactly the same size as on the bullseye target. It'll be the same on the 3D. And the nine ring, it's the same size as the nine ring on the bullseye target. The eight ring will actually be sort of an oblong, irregularly shaped scoring ring, and it'll be different on each of the five animals. And then the seven is actually going to be anywhere else on the animal except a horn, like on the antelope or the antlers of the deer. Uh, And then there's some foam around the legs of the turkey. Those are all be zeros. So it would be a 10, 9, 8, 7, and 0 are the possible scores of your arrow. There was a a number you had tossed out. Was it 4,500 students? About 4,600 is what we have capacity for. And they need to register for this in advance? Yes. And so that's about half of the shooting uh, body of students that will be at the national tournament. Yeah, about forty percent. Forty percent. I assume then the other sixty percent, uh, the are the range isn't big enough. They have no interest. What's the story there? The range is we don't have enough space. The we're going to add six hundred foot to the fourteen hundred feet that we already have for the bullseye tournament, and that's all the space we we have. So we'll add six hundred feet in the north hall at the Kentucky Exposition Center Fairgrounds, and that'll support twenty three of these five target ranges set end to end to end. There'll be uh, 115 targets total, but there'll be the same five on each of those 23. And that's all the space we have. Uh, so this will be a, uh, this is the first time we've ever done it. We'll see. We may book this thing up in just a day or two. And if we do, then next year we may have to expand the, the range size. There you go, Brian. More work for you next year. <laughs> that's fine. That's a good problem to have. Roy is prognosticating that uh, your work will double, perhaps next year. <laughs> But it yeah, makes we're you, looking forward to it. It makes you wonder, though, you get these kids, maybe they didn't sign up, maybe they're more uh, revved up over going to Kentucky to compete in the national, can I say championship, Roy, sure, the national sure. tournament. They're fired up over that. They look forward to this every year. And they overlook this new NASP and IBO 3D challenge. But when they get there and they see it, Hey, I want to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. Hey, I've got an hour free this afternoon, if not two or three. I, you know, I want to be a part of that. Is that an option? Can they go over there and sign up on the spot? No, they'll have to register in advance. And they must be in the bullseye tournament. They must register for it before they can register for 3D because this isn't designed to be an alternative to the bullseye face. NASP's foundation will continue to be the bullseye face with the 3D challenge, at least at our national tournament, as an additional opportunity. Opportunity. Now, at Brian's shoots, it'll be, it'll be the opportunity. So there's going to be a winner of this, even though the 3D challenge in no way affects the score that you do on bullseyes. Right. Will there be awards given for the 3D challenge as well? What do they win? We're going to have separate awards, and they will follow, I believe, the same format as the national awards. We're going to um, uh, award the, the full team that wins. 
and then we're also going to have individual awards. Right. Yeah, we have a first place team and a runner up team in all three of the divisions. See, this event is going to have the elementary, the middle, and the high school divisions. So there'll be a champion and runner up teams. There may be a third place team, but we've got to streamline the awards a little bit because the award ceremonies are going to be combined because it could be some of the same kids winning bullseye mm. that win Brian's 3D. So, and we don't want to turn it into a three hour award ceremony. And then, like Brian said, uh, he's going to give individual awards. The top three to five boys and girls in each of the divisions will receive individual awards as well. And I think he's going to do, Brian, you're going to do an overall boy and girl too, aren't you? Yes. This is very similar then to the bullseye tournament. You've got individuals, you do have teams, you have overall. That's going to be quite a tournament within itself. That gives the kids something extra to look forward to, I would suspect. You know, I'm sitting here thinking, Roy, Brian, this is going to improve their accuracy on the paper targets. What do you think? I think it will, and that's one of the things we discussed is, um, you know, some of the uh, coaches might want to sign up for an earlier time with the 3D event to practice for their target event. That may change down the road. They may want to warm up on the target event for the 3D, and we hope it gets to be to that point. But it certainly will improve their skills. Which would you rather shoot first, Brian, if it were you? If it was me, I, I think I would rather shoot the animals. So you do the, the 3D challenge first and then go to the defined where you know the precise distance on a paper target and then shoot. Roy, you the same? Yeah, I think yeah, so, it, yeah. It gives you a chance to warm up, and you're using the same shooting skills, but mm. you're able to warm up a little bit more for the target event, which is more of a repetitive type of uh, shooting. A while ago on the show, the subject came up of archery games. You're not going to shoot an apple off of someone's head, but you can do 3D targets. What else is out there maybe waiting in the wings to add to a NASP competition? Well, I I can tell you that there are some additional archery competitions that NAFS kids or 3D kids can go to. For example, the National Field Archery Association and USA Archery, they both have uh, marked distance tournaments, but they are more targets, different, many more distances and much longer distances than we shoot in the National Archery and the Schools program. So once a kid gets goes through NAFS, they might want to then expand their archery horizons by shooting bullseye tournaments that are outdoors and where there's wind and rain right. and everything else, plus at many different distances instead of just one or two distances. The football, uh, remember my, our friend Arlene Rohde with U.S. International Archer Magazine, mm-hmm held that world record and may still to this day, but she used what I'm going to call a foot bow and yeah. shot that on the salt flats in Utah. I didn't know that she was involved in that. Indeed she was. <laughs> you should look that up. That's I'm just the type. I will sit someplace and I'll just look around and say, so you're world's best at anything? You know, just as an icebreaker. <laughs> and sometimes people will say, well, you, as a matter of fact, I am. And it's, well, well, really, what would you do? That you're the world's best. And I hold the world's record for... Uh, shoot long shot of shooting a bow. I have a foot bow arrow. Someone gave it to me when I was doing a NAF training in California. It looks like a piece of spaghetti. It's very, very small like that. It's about as long as a strand of uncooked spaghetti. It's made of metal and has little bitty metal feathers and a tiny little point. And it can't weigh but just a couple, an ounce maybe or less. And that's what they shoot, you know, like a, almost thousands of, of yards. <laughs> yeah. So what are you the world's best at, Brian Markham? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> nothing right now. Um, <laughs> I was a professional archer for 18 years, and um, I've won four national championships and three world championships. So, And that was shooting with my fingers. I use a finger release. Nowadays, almost everyone uses a mechanical release. So we're kind of a dying breed. And this is one of the reasons why this NASP event is so important to me, is all of these kids are shooting with their fingers. And without sights. I think that's, yep, mm-hmm. and without sights. And I think that's a great discipline to keep. We don't want to shove a release in the kids' hands and tell them the only way they can be successful is to shoot target equipment with a release. Sort of equates to putting the calculator away and learning to do the mathematics yourself. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and uh, you know it teaches them the pure form 
are, you know, the pure discipline of archery. We really uh, love the whole idea of being involved with these kids at such an early age. And you'd mentioned earlier about different archery games that they can play. Jacob Wookie was on the Olympic team that won the silver medal, and he was from Oak Harbor, Ohio. And I knew Jake when he was a, a youngster, and he started out in the IBO and went to Junior Olympic Archery Development, which is the Joe Ed program. And he ended up shooting uh, on a college archery team before he made the Olympics. So the sky's the limit for these kids, and uh, we want to provide every opportunity we can for them. What opportunities are there within the IBO for children? We have several youth classes. Uh, we have a future bow owners class, uh, which is eight and under. Uh, we have a cub class, which is nine to 12, a youth hunter class, uh, 13 to 17, a youth hunter fingers class, uh, a YMR, which is youth male release, and that's uh, broken up into a 13 to 14 uh, age range and a 15 to 17. We have a female youth class, which is 13 to 17, and a youth traditional class. And that doesn't include our pure traditional events where we have Falcon Eagle classes. So we have several youth classes um, available with just normally a handful of kids in each one. And uh, we're sure hoping that, you know, we get some trickle-down effect from the NAS program to come out and and come outside and enjoy the uh, the 3D event. Mr. Markham, you betcha. That's going to happen. Archery is the topic on the show, specifically the all-new 3D Challenge, a joint effort between NASP, the National Archery in the Schools Program, and the IBO. We will have more from the leadership from both organizations when we return. I'm Charlie Baglin. You are listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We are back into our second half hour of Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. In the news, if you haven't heard, Lake Cumberland, water levels are on the rise. Good news for fishing, good news for boating, great news for the local economy. So come back, come back to Cumberland. The press release from the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife says it predicts the return of Lake Cumberland to its normal summertime levels will prove to be quite the boom to fishing in the coming years. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says the water level will go back up to the 723 feet above sea level by middle of May. Lake Cumberland, as we know, was lowered back in 2007, leading repairs to Wolf Creek Dam. Dropped down to 680 feet, so more than 40 feet. Here's what that 40 feet means. 40 feet in elevation, what's that mean? Well, when you add 40 feet of water, it's well what John Williams, the district fisheries biologist there, says is like adding a new lake. We're talking nutrient-rich water. I mean, it's like going to a smorgasbord. That's really going to make fishing fun. What else does that 40 feet of new water mean? It will take the surface area from 37,000 acres up to around 50,250 acres this summer. So come back to Cumberland. Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and do you have a kid who shoots archery in school? Will she or he be competing in the NAS National Tournament in May? Some exciting news on what they will find there, and we'll have more about it after the break. It's time to register for Kentucky's Elk Hunts. This is Tim Farmer. The Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website is Elk Central and the only place to enter this year's draw. Elk hunting in old Kentucky. Take it from me, there's nothing like it. 1,000 names will be drawn, and with the pick two option, you got to like your odds. The deadline is midnight, April 30th. The Kentucky Elk Draw. Enter at fw.ky.gov. Again, fw.ky.gov. This is Charlie Baglin back on Kentucky Field Radio, my home address for the rest of the hour. We are talking with two distinguished gentlemen in the field of archery. Brian Markham, who is the president of the International Bowhunting Organization, 
The group you know is the IBO, and Roy Grimes, president of the National Archery in the Schools program, otherwise known as NASP. We are talking about something new that will be unveiled this year for the first time at the NASP National Championship in Louisville. NASP and the IBO have joined forces. They will be introducing the NASP IBO 3D Challenge. Some variation on the targets, some variation on the distances shot. This, of course, in addition to the standard paper target that some 10,000 elementary, middle, and high school students are accustomed to. I think they're going to like what they see. And this is the great age group, because it pays to start early. And you, Brian, were a very young world champion. Uh, My first world championship was in uh, 1994. Now I'm uh, 49 now, so... 49. I did that without a calculator. (laughs) I did hear your shoes hit the floor, though. (laughs) (laughs) At what age did you get involved? Well, I was fortunate enough to have a father that was heavily involved in archery. In fact, he had an archery shop uh, Hmm. when I was a little kid, and... At the age of three, I started shooting a recurve bow and did that. Uh, I guess my dad got tired of me poking holes in the cellophane that wrapped up the little bear recurve set. So <laughs> he ended up giving me one and putting me out in the yard, and, and I was hooked. You know, I shot with my father and bow hunted since I was big enough for him to stick me in a tree stand. I have shot for years, and when I was involved in sports in high school, it you know, the competitive side kind of dropped off, and then... After I got out of high school, I missed that competition, and, you know, I started looking into the the national 3D events, and um, it was probably, I would say, the er very early 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, that I started attending the national level events. So, you know, archery's been a big part of my life and part of my family's life for years, and you know, the competition is addictive. It really is. And you can't teach that. That's that's born, you know, that's, that's in these kids. And um, we just have to bring it out. We have now 12 or so years of the National Archery of the Schools program under our belts. Let me just ask either one of you. Are you seeing now... Are you seeing national and world champions that have, are winning now that have had the benefit of NASP? We, in NASP, we definitely have had some of our students make the um, the Olympic dream teams. Uh, so there are the youth development programs for for the Olympics, but none of them have made it far enough to uh, to go through qualif- make it through qualifying and on on the Olympic team. But there's certainly some of them are going into that form of archery. Brian may know more about the 3D side. We do know that many of the NASP students are going to 3D shoots, but. And we do definitely have NAS students who have college scholarships going to college now and shooting on their archery teams. Some of our national and world champions are doing that right now. For example, Ryan Long uh, from um, Richmond, Kentucky. He is uh, on the um, the Cumberland archery team. So what's the odds of somebody just picking this up because it's fun at their local elementary school or middle school and it wind up really changing their career? Now, if that means they're a champion shooter elsewhere, or they mm-hmm. uh, be- become a, a coach, or that it really shapes the direction of their life. Have you seen, is it too early really to see that I, yet? I can throw some things in there, Charlie. We've had some students who have graduated and gotten master's degrees and have come and spoken to our coordinator, NASP coordinators at our conference. And so some of them have been influenced by archery to, they, they admit, and their parents admit, to do better in school, to go on to college when they never dreamed that they would go on to college and then even earn master's degrees. We've had some kids that were in NASP that have gone on to help the NASP coordinator in their states or do trainings, for example, for the Safari Club at uh, the Wilderness Leadership School in uh, Wyoming. So we know all of that's going on out there. And I can just tell you from a personal experience that archery is going to take a lot of these kids outdoors more often than they might have gone. It did that with me. I believe I I was a wildlife biologist. That was my career, you know, because of archery. Matter of fact, my old bosses in Missouri used to ask me, was I a biologist bow hunter or a <laughs> bow hunter biologist? And they were a little d- disappointed when I said, well, I'm a bow hunter first and then a biologist. You could be in uh, the marching band in high school, and I, and I would assume that some of the same regulations are going to be in place, that if you want to march and play in the band and you've got to make 
good grades elsewhere in school. I would just assume that that's pretty much across the board. If you're going to be on the baseball team, basketball team, you've got to make the grades to do that. And now archery is now a part of that mix, too, because not every kid can run fast, jump high, or is musically inclined. But archery sort of fills that gap. I can make a contribution. Right. The survey I told you about of the national tournament participants last summer, or in May, 30% of the students said that NASP had helped them with their academics. It helped them have better focus, better discipline, and be more interested in school. 39% of them said that their attendance was better, that they were more likely to go to school because archery was part of their school life. I could have used archery back in the day. I really could. I could have used your program. I think a lot of people could. Brian Markham himself may have amounted to something <laughs> if he had had NASP. Instead of having to wait till he was 29 to be a national and world champion, he may have done it. I don't know. How soon do you think maybe he could have done that? Brian, you think it had knocked uh, four or five years off of that? I tell you what, I would have loved to, to have had NASP when I was in, in school and you know, we uh, we had an archery program where you just have uh, wooden arrows and little fiberglass recurve bows, and it's come so far now with the Genesis bows and the equipment that they have and, and just the organization, you know, of the NASP. I, I would hate to see what could have happened back then if all of these kids would have been introduced to archery at such an early time in our history. It's just a great opportunity for us to be associated with NASP. And in the articles of our bylaws, it says, you know, one of our main purposes is to assist youth organizations for the promotion and encouragement of the sport of bow hunting. You know, what greater organization to be associated with than, than NASP? One thing I can tell you, too, Charlie, <clears throat> you hear about adults like myself and, and others. We, we go back to some of the sports we played in schools, and we blame some of our mobility issues on an old football injury or an old injury here and that. <laughs> if the archers won't be able to say that. Yeah. Archery is so safe. They won't be able to refer to any archery injuries that they have because they're so, so rare. I'd like to say that I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you and Roy today, and and uh, anything we can do to, to get the word out and promote this, um, you know, is a, is a great thing. And, and I, I really look forward uh, to the event, and I think it's going to be, a, you know, a great opportunity for both uh, organizations. And and I, I just think it's a, it's a perfect match. I, I think it is, too. And, Brian, knowing a little bit more as I've gotten to know you over the last half hour or so, I can see that you are excited about bringing more kids and better recruitment into archery through the NAS program. This is going to be a big thing. And when you introduce it to a world record-setting crowd, and even if they're not participating, I guarantee you they're over there watching, and they're saying, next year, that's me. You've got to feel good about that. Yeah, yeah, I do. And, um, you know, we just... We're creating the opportunity for them. It's, it's an optional event and, and we want to create that opportunity. We know the kids love shooting 3D. It was great that NAST allowed the 3D event to be with their nationals and, and, uh, just to give that opportunity to these kids is going to be, it's going to be awesome. And Brian will be able to um, add another world mark to his resume after this tournament because if we get our 4,600 kids, we will almost double the size of the largest 3D tournament ever held. <laughs> That's yeah. great. That's, That's great. That's going to be a great announcement to make when we're done. Now, this is your first year as the chief of the IBO. Congratulations and welcome to it. Uh, I was wondering if uh, Watkins, Ken Watkins. Yeah. did he yeah. leave big shoes to fill? I'm sure he did. He did. He was there for 19 years and, um, you know, through some of the, the greatest growth of the sport um, and did a tremendous job for the IBO. And, and I do have big shoes to fill. And, you know, hopefully when this thing uh, grows with NASP, and, and I'm sure it will. You know, I'll, I'll be able to dedicate a lot more time to it. We're already hearing from many of the states, Charlie, that, for example, Iowa and Alabama and some of those states, that they're going to offer the challenge at their state tournaments, if not this year, next year. And that's all part of the plan, to to hatch a concept that is extremely inviting to NASP. It is so like what they already do, except for the target at unmarked yardages, that 
they're going to they're going to want to do it in great numbers. And so then we hope after we launch it at the nationals that it'll find its way into state NAS tournaments around the country wherever they have a large enough venue to accommodate it. And then Brian will take them outdoors by offering it at his large events for these kids of, of five to twelve kids that that will constitute a three D team. Sounds like a win win. Well, thanks, Charlie. It was nice to meet you and. Uh Good to talk to you again, Roy, and uh, we'll look forward to, uh, to May. Okay, Brian. We need to get to a break. We'll ask Roy Grimes to stay with us for the rest of the hour, talk a little bit about how archery has grown and continues to grow, not just around the nation, but globally. I'm Charlie Baglin. This is Kentucky Field Radio. We are back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and the subject of the program this hour has been the National Archery in the Schools program. Roy Grimes is my guest. Roy is the president of NASP, and Roy, once upon a time, there's a restaurant we like to go to, McDonald's. They would post on their signs, 2,300,000 hamburgers sold. And then it bumped up to 8.5 million hamburgers served. Now it's up to like billions and billions, the signs say. And that sounds to me a lot like NASP. Has the number of students that have been through your program just grown? I mean, it's an uncountable number. Yeah, in fact, <laughs> I just started to generalize that in my mind just now. We know that last school year, the number of students that went through the program was just a little over 2.5 million. And uh, before that, it was 2,055,000 the year in 2012. And I'd sort of been uh, adding those together every year, and but, but I'm sort of lost somewhere at 15 million that have been through the program. As far as states, can we count all 50? No, 47 still. We're still waiting on Delaware, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Uh, Delaware is getting very close. The Fish and Wildlife Agency's top leadership is interested in NASP and wants to adopt the program. So we're hoping that 2014 will be the year that we finally get off of 47 and go to 48. And uh, we're not, I don't know about Rhode Island, Vermont. We are adding other countries, in fact, more than we're adding other states. We'll add our eighth Canadian province this year when Ontario joins the program on August the 6th. Um, you know that last year Mongolia joined. Uh, the United Kingdom is getting ready to join the program. Congratulations. That's good. You've been wanting the United Kingdom to be in there for quite a while. It's a big archery country. They've had some interest. and In fact, we've trained schools in the United Kingdom to to teach NASP and to do it, but they they haven't adopted it as a country. Now we have an organization and a fellow who has extremely experience in broadcast media and archery and has all kinds of uh, contacts and networks in that country, even with Archery Great Britain. So I think we've found our lead now, and he's going to come to Kansas City, and we're going to train him if we, if he can understand us. Number of people, the number of countries now in NASP, Canada, United Kingdom. Well, not, we wouldn't count United Kingdom yet. They'd be number ten when they join. So internationally, Mm -hmm. what are the countries that are part of it? U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and Mongolia. I would like to put in a request that we have the next world championship in Australia. That'd be pretty cool. And I would like to come. (laughs) That would would be wonderful. The trick is picking a place where 3,000 kids can follow us. The world tournament needs to be at least 3,000 kids. And so far, I don't think we're ready to take a world tournament outside the United States yet. You know that we did start the all-star tournaments last summer, and that is a smaller event where each nation designates its 16-member all-star team. Those all-stars went to South Africa last year. They'll be in Madison, Wisconsin this year, immediately following the World Tournament, and I suppose we'll be in Canada in 2015, and then who knows where we'll go in 2016 with just the all-star teams. The national tournament is coming up Mother's Day weekend in Louisville, Mm -hmm. and the World Championship, the World Tournament that you just mentioned is coming up in July. July 12, 13. Mm Mm-hmm. Is it growing the way you wanted it to? When you left Florida after three or four years at Disney World, has that spurred growth in 
folks who will tr- travel to be a part of the NASP World Championship? It grew every year. It grew from 600 to about 1,400, but it took us four years to get there. The very first year, last year, where we went to St. Louis, we grew to 2,900. We more than doubled just because we went to sort of the middle of the country instead of on the fringes down in Florida. Madison's going to be another experiment for us. Some people think Madison is a little bit too far north uh, for for NASP's schools to send teams we'll find out if we get uh, 2,500 to 3,000 kids in Madison then we might be willing to even get further away from the middle of the country but if we don't if Madison is a smaller event like Orlando was you'll see NAS the world tournament moving back to the middle to Indianapolis or Nashville where do you think this is all going to lead I'd like to see in the next five years, I'd like to see all 50 states in the program. I think every Canadian province will be in the program by then. We have a new protocol now for countries, the 40 countries that have contacted us that want to be in. We haven't gone there uh, because, frankly, we we just couldn't uh, afford the time and travel to go do it. But now our protocol is you come here and we'll train you and send you back. I'd like to see the number of countries double. But uh, more importantly, I would like to see as many students that go to school have a chance to learn the benefits benefits of archery and they go far beyond just shooting arrows. I'd love to see 20,000 schools in our program in the next five years. What were you thinking when you said to Commissioner Tom Bennett of the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife? March 3rd, 2002 is when we launched it. Mm-hmm. What were you thinking? Were you thinking anything like that you would be saying what you just said now? No, no. I was hoping we'd have 120 schools someday in Kentucky and had no idea anybody else would pay attention to what we were doing. And, of course, the first thing we had to get by was schools. Would schools even allow archery to be practiced in their gymnasium? Is that a uh, deadly weapon? Some people would, would, would classify it that. In yeah. some schools, they have to uh, get a waiver to shoot in their schools because their city has an ordinance against it. It's amazing how far it has come. Yeah. I'm just impressed every time we sit down and chat. Yeah, I'm, the, the teachers that go to the training and spend eight hours of their life to be trained so that they can bring something new and interesting that will help their students develop, they're the ones to be congratulated, and those are the ones that we lean on. If this wasn't good for their mission, I wouldn't be here talking to you about this. Roy, thanks a million. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Roy Grimes, president of the National Archery in the Schools program. Let me encourage you to attend this NASP National Championship. Now, when I say you, I mean you and your best friend and your wife, your kids, your husband, your friends from your office. Gather a group from your church. Gather your little league team, your female softball team, and come to this. 10,800 kids expected to be there. That's a world record. Targets lined up end to end to end to end, as far as you can see. 500 shooters at a time all day long. This is the World Series of Baseball, the Indy 500, the Kentucky Derby of archery. It is a program born in Kentucky, May 9th, 10th, that's a Friday and Saturday, in Louisville at the Kentucky Fair and Exposition Center, well worth the drive from wherever you are hearing this broadcast. Plus, it's a cheap ticket. We are out of time. This is Charlie Baglin. Join us in a week, and we will go inside outdoors again, right here on Kentucky Afield Radio.